Hey everybody, welcome. This is Ian O'Byrne. I'm the department editor for the Journal of Adolescent and Adult Literacy, uh, the Multiliteracies Department Editor. Um, what we've done is we've put together a series of interviews to talk with people in the field, experts in the field, about the columns to get some more uh, depth and perspective on the materials and the issues that we bring up in the column. Um, and so this uh, latest piece was on digital badges and we looked at, uh, as part of the research, we looked at the mouse ecosystem. So I wanted to bring on Mark from Mouse. Uh, Mark, hi, you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hey, Ian. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Um, uh, my name is Mark Lesser. I'm the senior director for learning design at Mouse, um, and we're really excited to be uh, part of the article and and part of the journal, and uh, are are you know proud to have the work featured uh, to hopefully help continue the dialogue around uh, you know alternative credentials and thinking about uh, what the the affordances of digital badges are. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, so in the piece, we, we focus on one of your students, one of your alumni. Um, we also, you know, focus on mouse and the mouse ecosystem, and we use that as a way to look at digital badges and what digital badges mean. One of the things I've been doing in these interviews is asking people right from the outset, you know, experts that are in the field making and issuing these things about digital badges. So how do you define digital badges? That's a that's a such a good question. I, I have a a fairly um, a fairly broad definition for digital badges, and the reason for that is, you know, I, I think that when a lot of us in the community, likely uh, you or I, would agree on the idea that um, the greatest potential for digital badges is as a graphic representation of data or a doorway to data. Um, but I think the thing that we can't um, we can't diminish is how uh, what the end user's perception of badges are, and um, especially if, as a community, we're we're still using the nomenclature badge. I think we have to respect the fact that people are coming to this from an idea about badges that comes out of. Uh, a, an offline space. It's a it's a piece of fabric you put on a sash or um, or a shield that you put on a uniform, um, and there is something there that that we're we're not going to be able to erase, and we're not going to be able to um, immediately sort of transform people's definition. So so I define digital badges fairly widely. I I see um, you know. About a year and a half after we started to design our badging system for mouse, um, we actually were, uh, this was right around the time of the DML challenge in 2012, and uh, I came home one day, uh, and we were sort of in the thick of proposing our, our project um, for the DML challenge, and I came home one day, and my son was on the couch, who at the time was was maybe three, a little over three, um, and was... Um, was annoyed because the software on the iPad wasn't working to get his Chuggington badge, um, and and he was playing a Disney game where you know each each level you sort of hit in Chuggington, which was um, I don't even remember the sort of mechanics of the game, but you were essentially earning a badge as you move through the game, and uh, you know we talk a lot about motivation and badges, and and he he loved uh, the fact that he was sort of leveling up. Uh, from one board to the next, but there really wasn't anything behind it. It was it was just a graphic representation. I consider that as much a digital badge as I do um, something with a lot of data behind it, uh, because I, I think that you know for us to realize the potential of this uh, this tool and this system for doing things, um, I think it has to be a diverse ecosystem where um, lots of different uh, variations can take place and and I think we're going to get a lot of value there where one plays off of another um, so so my definition is fairly wide I consider it uh, you know a, a digital badge I consider a, a graphic representation of uh, data that marks an experience or skill uh, and that is uh, shared and displayed online I, I think it's funny because I've had 
that same uh, experience where you know I, I I come home or I'm doing work and I look over and my son is furious. You know, he's playing with the iPad and he's furious because you know on the driving simulator or whatever it doesn't it's not showing you know that badge. Um, you know, and it, I like to know what he's doing on those devices and watch him. But at the same time, all of a sudden you go to help you know troubleshoot. And you look and you see these these badges, these markers, you know, and you're like, I didn't even know that this was happening. You know, it's like almost like they subverted, you know, they're using badges in my own house on my own son, you know, and it sort of, it, it surprises you. Um, yeah. While you're out there uh, spreading the good word about the importance of these things being a serious a serious artifact for learning, uh, you come home and suddenly, you know, Disney's dropped one on your doorstep. Yep. Um, oh, Disney's like, famous for them. Yeah, and that's uh, the thing. I think that that's important. I, I actually think that there's an important history there. You know, we we all the idea of badges didn't come out of thin air, and I think um, there are you know there is a a huge um, digital gaming industry that has been tinkering with this idea in the context of game narratives for a very long time now. Um, you know, there are the, the sort of offline, uh, the, the textile and, and shield versions of badges that, um, you know, we've been using for a century. Um, you know, there, there are all of these, these, um, these ins points of inspiration out there, and I think, uh, you know, that's why, to me, I think the broadest definition is most useful at the moment while we're figuring out um, what all of the affordances are. I think... Uh, it's important to keep in mind uh, what all badges represent in the various cultures that we're trying to influence in in uh, in a in a learning context. And I think what I really like about your example of you know the game and and the Disney badges you know or any gaming badges is that they could be for relatively low level or you know uh, you know almost simple you know uh, achievements for students. You know, I mean, we look at badges, and it's we want thick, rich metadata to really show an experience. And you know, we're saying, you know, hopefully a student could earn a badge, you know, and use this as a credential to get into college, you know, or or get a job. But then at the same time, there is a place for, hey, you sent out your first tweet. Congrats! Here's a badge. Or mm -hmm. you know, you went from level two to level three in this video game. Congrats! Here's a badge. And then I think there's power in the user, the participant, the gamer, the student, whoever, looking at it and saying, well, "What is this? I don't know what it is. I like it. I like how I feel, and I want another one." You know. And then maybe that changes the culture around badges. Yeah. Yeah. That that that's. Uh... Right on. I think uh, somewhere early, very early in the conversation, this would would have been, um, you know, uh, probably four or five years ago at this point. Um, I remember being at a meeting with Alex Halavey, who uh, at the time was was I, he's still doing a lot in the. He's a uh, professor. He was at Quinnipiac and then ASU for a while. And uh, to be honest, I'm not sure where he is now. But but. Uh, you should find Alex on on Twitter because uh, he's doing some amazing things in higher ed, where you know he's he's structuring his classes around badges and and uh, has been doing it for a really long time and and has some great ideas. But in any case, in one of those conversations, uh, he I don't know if he was referencing or or it was his his idea uh, of the Woody Allen badge, where uh, you know there there's a spectrum and it starts with. Um, you know, a, a badge for just showing up, and and you know the the question on the table was, is there a place for that? Um, and I think some people would argue no, uh, but but I would argue yes, and I think especially in particular, you know, in particular contexts, I think, um, and and back to the motivation question, I think it's really important that we're thinking about um, badge, digital badges as a system. And um, if the system, um, if there is only one uh, value or one um, sort of unit of measure in that system, it's going to become a very boring um, setup, right? It's, it's, it's not going to help you uh, change your uh, ideas about how these things can be 
uh, put together, and and uh, it's not going to be a particularly empowering landscape for certain. And I think um, when we use one unit of measure for what a badge is, we start to very quickly um, replicate a system that exists, and nobody who is doing this. Uh, at least, you know, my hope is that nobody who's doing this is is aiming to replicate the current system. Yeah. Um, it, one of the speaking of systems, one of the things that I really learned from working with the my co-authors on this piece is that, you know, and and I believed it to be true, but now I I really see the the you know real connection between the badges and the ecosystem, you know, and how the badges should be a direct reflection of you know the values of the ecosystem and and the you know the the knowledge and the beliefs and the dispositions that we want to promote um, so that being said you know we focused on mouse in this column can you explain mouse the origins of mouse the you know the belief systems the the different offshoots or iterations of mouse um, because i think it's terribly important to understand that context I, I can definitely, uh, and and maybe you'll remind me just to come back to that that point that you just made about um, you know badges the 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 badging system being a reflection of uh, okay. values because that's that's huge for us. So yeah, M Mouse is a um, seventeen year old nonprofit. We were founded in New York um, at the height of the tech bubble. Um, the sort of origin story for us as a nonprofit is uh, we had a founder of ours walk into a neighborhood school in, in the area of uh, Union Square, and it was Washington Irving High School, and, and he walked in, and their, the tech class that they were serving up was, this was 1997, height of the bubble, uh, you know, information moving as fast as uh, the world had seen it. And it was a group of, you know, 10th or 11th graders taking apart IBM Selectric typewriters. Um, and, you know, Mass was really born out of the local community's realization that um, there was just a, a tremendous gap. And we've talked as a field for now decades about that gap, um, obviously. But, but we started really as a volunteer list where people were wiring schools, doing these sort of weekend barn raisings. Um, and when you look at the data between 1997 and around 2001, you know, it's remarkable. There were, there were mouses, uh, one of a, a few organizations and obviously a huge effort from the federal government who stepped in and, and started to wire schools. And um, where we began as a youth development program was um, seeing the, the very uh, obvious opportunity where uh, there was a tremendous need in communities, uh, in school communities, and learning communities, um, to now all of a sudden we're connected to this information. We have all of this hardware and software uh, in a campus, and and we really not only do we not necessarily have what we need in terms of capacity to uh, infuse it into our instruction, but we also don't have what we need uh, to maintain and uh, and and welcome in this infrastructure. Um, so, so where we were born was really the opportunity uh, for learning environments to turn themselves on their head for a moment and bring young people into the fold as a as a uh, a member of the leadership team to help uh, bring that infrastructure along and help educators think about what it means to infuse technology into what they do. Um, and over the course of you know, the coming 15 years or so, um, we really have evolved into an organization that that has a unique niche where uh, we focus on empowering young people uh, to think about um, the social purpose of technology and to think about what it means to be empowered not only um, as a consumer, which we see as being a minor role and, and needing to frame it that way, uh, to young people and and seeing their role instead as creative innovators and and people who are thinking about uh, how they use technology for change is really where we're focused now and have been for a while. Um, we have a few different we have a national flagship program that that many um, would recognize if they know us uh, it's called Mouse Squad, which uh, starts with 
a, a sort of club-like environment for schools and after-school programs. We exist in uh, beacon centers and all kinds of uh, places where they're essentially leveraging young people's initial interest and identity around themselves as a technologist uh, to help start to structure that and, and really um, put a, a, an authentic and meaningful situation around it, right? So what does it mean if a, if a team of us are all really interested um, in uh, games or 3D or electronics, what does it mean uh, to sort of uh, authorize that person in a way that helps uh, them step up and do something really meaningful with it for whether it's their school or their community. Uh, and that's what Mouse Squad is really all about. It's, it's young people stepping up um, for the most part in their school environments uh, to set up a club that's really in service of the school first, but in a, in a reciprocal way. It's about them starting to build an identity that very much tracks into uh, STEM areas, uh, STEM focus. So um, while they are uh, working on a club uh, in, um, in any one of our sites uh, in, in sort of service of the school, and, and this year especially, uh, where testing, a lot of testing in, in New York and this area especially has, has moved online, um, you know, while they may be having a really critical role in figuring out, um, helping the school figure out how they deliver this kind of thing, um, they are after school coming together as young game designers, as uh, getting into physical computing, uh, thinking about the carbon footprint of technologies at their site, and, and how do we think about renewable energy that, that will power the devices of the future. Um, so, so, so that's our flagship program, Mouse Squad. All of that is built... Um, is really designed on a trajectory to, to land young people into a place where um, regardless of what path they take, whether, um, whether they end up um, a software engineer or, uh, or a doctor, for that matter, the idea for us is not that we're motivating every one of those students uh, to see themselves as uh, as um, an engineer or an IT person, what we're motivating young people to think about is how uh, the functions of technology are going to do good for the world in any field that they pursue and try to build under them a foundation, uh, you know, for their skills and, and their dispositions that are going to help them do that. Um, and then in, in New York, you heard in the first interview with Zena. Um, who is now a student down at Virginia Tech. Um, she was a part of a, an advanced program that we run called Mouse Core, which is uh, a year-long uh, program focused on human-centered design. Young people are spending about 120 hours with us after school uh, and really thinking about and, and learning the process of human-centered design and, and uh, putting their skills to work um, to develop and prototype working uh, technologies for the betterment of their, you know, local or global communities. Uh, in New York, we have this great partnership with United Cerebral Palsy, and uh, our students are really focused on assistive and adaptive tech um, and, and working on technologies that help um, change uh, they're the end users that they're designing alongside um, that aim to change their day to day, um, and we've seen uh, so many amazing projects. Uh, and hopefully, in the in the follow up or in the description of the video, I can I can also drop a link to some video that describes that program as well. Will do. Um, one of the the earlier questions, and then it, it basically ties into this. We talked about digital badges or badges as a representation or a signifier or, or whatever, an identification of the ethos or the belief system, you know, or the, the knowledge, skills, and dispositions that you want to highlight and promote within your ecosystem. So given what you just said about mouse, how do, you know, how does, how do your badges and your badging ecosystem, how do those exist within what mouse is and how do they promote that ethos or that belief system within mouse. So I'm thinking about 
okay, now that we know what mouse is and, and all of the, the permutations of that, how do badges exist within that ecosystem and how do they act as a vehicle to promote what you're all about? Yeah. So I, uh, I love that question. And it's really, it comes back to the, the sort of placeholder that we left around, uh, belief systems. Mouse, when we started to design our system in 2009, um, over, uh, this surprises a lot of folks that I talk to about our system is that um, this, among a couple of other things, was actually our uh, our highest priority when we started to design our system. Um, we had, you, you have to know the the programmatic context a little bit. So we had, at the time, probably somewhere around 250 sites nationally. Um, we had grown from our sort of base in New York through affiliates in places like California and Chicago who have have um, used our model and content to grow uh, sites of their own. Uh, within our network and and we were facing the question of um, when we don't have when when headquarters doesn't have a a site-based staff in each one of those places and our model is is built on the idea that we're building capacity for each one of these learning environments to run this on their own um, what are the mechanisms that we have to share and ethos and values that tie our members back to the things that we find important. Um, and that was really where, in, in large part, where we started. Um, one of the things we, we sought to do right away was to think about, we, for decades, as, um, you know, the f field of education, both uh, formal and informal learning spaces have been debating, you know, and and talking about the sort of jargon of 21st century skills. And uh, when we talk to uh, industry folks who are hiring, nine out of ten times, the the skills that they come to us and say, this is what we're looking for that we're not seeing out of recent graduates, Nine out of ten times, the top three things are actually 21st century or soft skills, however you want to frame them. Um, Non-cognitive skills, although I hate that term. Um, that's what they point to. And so, so as an example of one of the things that we wanted to convey, you know, sort of in the thinking about ethos, one of the things we wanted to convey is we wanted to put credentials alongside one another uh, that weighed evenly um, 21st century or soft skills alongside uh, hard skills and competencies, right? So uh, I want to know that young people are as interested in building their skills, responding to their peers' questions as they are, you know, learning HTML and CSS. Um, it, it's, and we know that the stakes are extremely high. We know that those are the critical skills um, that bring the hard skills to a place that they become practical for the world right now. Uh, so, so part of what we wanted to do was really um, uh, level the playing field and stop considering uh, things like um, community participation and and the stuff that in industry through models like Stack Overflow, we know in, in you know in a lot of cases are 80% of the badges that they care about are the things that are uh, the soft competencies where uh, you know it's about how well you answer questions and how quickly you can get to the root of a problem and and those kinds of things. So so that's one example of of where we were really trying to convey ethos. Um, the other thing we were doing in in the with the this what we were talking about earlier in terms of different doses of badging is is we were also um, using the system as a mechanism to um, issue what we call community we within our system we call sort of a micro credentials are called wins uh, so uh, right away we designed a system that was built on a combination of of community wins and then you had hard skills wins um, and the uh, you know 
we were doing things to sort of dose those wins in such a way that, um, you know, students were seeing that what we valued when they were posting to their blog or responding to um, cases, we have a ticket tracking system, if they're responding to cases or commenting on one another's work, uh, that those things are of uh, as high a value to us or, or even in some cases more so than whether or not they know um, uh, you know, n networks or circuits or or whatever else it is. I think it's um, it, it's amazing because you can see parallels. You know, if you were to integrate this in your classroom, you know, uh, we we see business coming again and again, saying, you know, you're not sending students out with the skills that they need. We have to recognize that for most for most of our students, you know, when they grow up and they go out in the workforce. They won't sit face to face, you know, with another person, and that's their job. You know, I mean, we see. I was listening to um, the the four hour work week the other day, and they had one of the founders of um, I think it was Wikipedia. No, it wasn't Wikipedia. I'm trying to remember who was on there, but they basically talked about a distributed workforce. It was a WordPress founder. You know, we have a distributed workforce. We have people all around globally. Um, how are we preparing our students to go into that environment? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, if we bring this into a classroom, you could have uh, one of the things I love to do in my classroom is I would have students work and peer edit and review each other's content. Um, you know, and, and having students look at each other's work and discuss, you know, some of the things that they, the, the strengths and then the challenges in their work and reflect upon the experience. That that's a skill set that we need. It's just providing a space where we can document those skills over time. Then, as the teacher, I can say, okay, you know what, Jose, I love the fact that when you were talking about Mayor Cruz's work, you were honest and open, and you also were, you know, you were critical, but at the same time, you were respectful of the work that she put together. And I value that, and I want to, you know, I'm going to badge you, or I'm going to recognize that. And then other students, the other way that I see badges as a powerful force is identity. You know, other students can say, well, you know what, Mr. O'Byrne really loved when Jose did that, you know, so I'm going to start to act like that as well. I'm going to start to to show those behaviors. I'm going to have those dispositions or those soft skills mm -hmm. because that's important here. Not only is it what I know, but it's how I interact with others and the way that I interact. Um, so you talked about the way that, you know, the, the thought process as you led into, you know, and you developed and, and scaled up the badges. Um, for, for educators, for, you know, people in secondary and higher ed that are considering their own badges, their own ecosystem, you know, I think it's helpful that you describe the thought process leading into it and the, and the why, but what are some things that you learned along the way? What are some challenges, some opportunities, what are some you know, issues that you saw along the way, you know, lessons learned now that you look back? Um, there, there's uh, a lot of, a lot of good ones and, and uh, one of the things that we're starting to get around to doing is to document more of them and, and make sure we're pushing more of that out into uh, blog posts and things. So, so hopefully you'll see more of those, and I don't have to describe every one of our uh, our, our challenging moments. But um, you know, I think that um, I think a couple of things. If if I you know when I chat with folks, it's such a small world of of folks who are trying to. Um, use digital badges to do really amazing things in their own context and also engage the, the broader conversation uh, around equity and, um, you know, diversifying the fields we care about and, and that kind of work. When, when, so, so in that small world, uh, I have a lot of conversations with folks who are sort of starting with, you know, starting from scratch or have been thinking about this for a long time but, but reluctant to jump in because things seem like they're changing so quickly and and it's kind of hard to get a foothold um, so I, the the couple of themes that um, usually come up for me is um, I think patience is absolutely critical um, 
one of the, you know, I work in a, a K-12 environment, obviously. We work primarily in middle and high schools. Um, and you have, you learn very quickly that the cycles of a school calendar are not software development cycles, right? So in, unless you're going to develop everything, um, everything you plan to do over the summer and you can launch by September and then sit around and, and watch that data come in, um, in all likelihood, you're a smaller organization that's, that's being scrappy about how you put this together. Um, and you have to embrace, you know, an, a sort of agile methodology going into it, and in, you know, and and be doing, you know, small releases of things throughout the year. Um, and where patience comes in is that you might have no choice but to release, you know, a feature within the system or a new badge um, at a time that's not ideal. You might drop it in when regions testing is going on, or um, you know, there, or it's Christmas break, or just after Christmas break when when folks are just in the mad dash to catch up. And uh, I think we just need to be more patient um, than than a lot of folks tend to be. We want to see instant results because of the the sort of pace of the web. Folks want to like drop it into a community and then. Um, and then see it work right away. You know, like want to see a ticker uh, moving, and and it doesn't work that way. Um, like anything, I think designing a badge system is about building as much about building a culture of use as it is about building a technology, and um, and that takes time. We, uh, I think, it was really not until we had maybe three years under our belt. Uh, that we that we started to um, we then started to have something of a data and reporting process in place that was good enough to kind of get us um, the kind of numbers and reporting that we were interested in. Um, but even once that was in place, it took a, you know more time for us to see the the culture of use sort of building to a place where we could actually start to pull out um, some learning about what the trends were. Um, so, so patience is, is one of them. Um, another I would say is we spend a lot of time thinking about as, you know, educators are always uh, prone to do the impact. Uh, we, you know, we think about the impact on the individual constantly and we're sort of super focused on uh, that and and not for bad reason at all, uh, but I also think that there are a lot of affordances to digital badges that have to do with the ecosystem that supports students. So um, I think not forgetting early on to think about how badge data might improve your nonprofit or improve your school or the efficiency with which um, you know teachers can move through certain parts of their curriculum uh, because they've been able through badges to automate certain things about their gradebook. Um, there, there are all kinds of affordances that I think we tend to think about, you know, the long term of what this looks like in the hands of a young person or an adult um, learner, but we don't spend a lot of time thinking about what does my organization look like 10 years from now because of this? And I can tell you within, you know, within a couple of years, we had um, more real-time data than we've ever had in, in you know, at, at the time, in 15 years of being an organization. You know, we had more real-time data about who was using our site, when, at what times of day, um, what they were sort of focusing in on. Um, you know, and, and most of that was badge data, and even when that badge data was, um, even before you, you bring the system to a place where it's sophisticated enough to know who the individual is, and, and when it's anonymized, that's extremely valuable data for a little nonprofit who doesn't have hands out in all of these places to know, oh, okay, well, let me make, this is, this is formative data, like, let me make a shift in what I'm delivering uh, so that I'm not doing uh, whatever it is, an online event at a time when nobody seems to be online in California or, or whatever it is. Um, these are all, you know, really important 
really important pieces. Um, and then the the uh, I think there's a lot of we talked a little bit about it, but but there's a lot of conversation around digital badges um, where we very quickly get into a, a, the sort of death spiral of um, you know existing structures and how do we basically create badging systems that complement existing um, existing systems for assessment and for um, you know all, all you, everybody watching this likely knows the systems uh, we're talking about whether it's uh, standards or or um, even when things get more more um, even even when things move toward things like portfolios and get interesting around you know how do we think about students demonstrating learning a lot of times we really do um, in a, a digital environment tends to start to mirror the constraints of what we can do offline and and I think uh, part of and you really need to as a whether you're a designer an educator or both or a team of folks in that space um, everybody needs to you know somewhere on their wall you know put a post-it note that just reminds them uh, not to not to duplicate and not to uh, replicate something that they're actually trying to um, they're, they're actually trying to uh, work against you know what I mean in some ways or 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 break apart for the purpose of improvement um, so so those are a few big ones that that come up pretty frequently and all are things you know we by no means uh, did we go into each go into this um, having a really clear head around any one of those things and we're still learning in each each one of those areas it's a lot of great feedback and it's um you know that's one of the things that I found is that you know I'm not at the level that all of you are you know in terms of thinking about and playing with badges and issuing badges and guiding others um, but one of the things that I saw is that you know I would try and think you know, I'm an educational psychologist. You know, I'm interested in motivation and, and knowledge and skills and those soft skills. And I would have in my mind, here's what I think this badge is going to do. Here's what I think the user will do with the badge. You know, and then here's how these badges will reflect this culture or this ecosystem. And here's how the badges will work together. Um, and then I, when you release it into the wild, then something completely different happens. Yeah. You look at it and you're like, oh, I didn't see that happening. Now I need to go back and change a little bit. Um, so yeah. it's it's being persistent and flexible, and you know all the things that we want our students to be. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think I, that's that's spot on. And I think one of one of the one of the things that keeps people from from doing this stuff um, that I sometimes forget to share, but I'm glad it popped into my brain is. You know, one of the things we were, and I think every organization or classroom is um, is concerned about when they start to think about badges are, you know, two big things come up. One is um, gaming, uh, you know, the the badging system, and the other is if you have a sort of open end to the badging system where you know possibly uh, a, a peer is working on uh, issuing a badge to another. Student, um, where things are open, people fear that young people aren't ready for that um, responsibility. Um, and I think in you know certainly every once in a while something crops up where usually it's our our fault for having made it so easy to game something. Um, and and really what we see. Typically, it's one or two students in the context of our of 4,000 um, nationally who will do a great job of pulling out that that little bug or that little hole that we left and exploiting it. And and that is the very literacy that you know we're working to empower young people with is to understand how systems work. And you know so. Uh, we don't fault it. Uh, you know, we we typically um, it, it's a very small percentage of young people who do it, and typically they'll do it to sort of 
watch how outstanding it is that um, and see them you know reward themselves for having point picked out something that's easy to game um, but it ends up being our feedback you know we can quickly fix that kind of bug or or you know reframe a, a design in such a way that puts a control there um, and and then in open systems where responsibility you know and and flaming is a question and you know is this going to be are we going to release something that ends up being you know another vehicle for uh, you know, uh, scary things that happen online between uh, teens or, or other young people. Um, you know, the, the thing I always just remind people and tell stories around is uh, how naturally young people gravitate, especially when they are in a, a community and a context where the values are clear and the ethos is clear and they have good supports. Um, young people gravitate to the you know roles of responsibility and and young people are activists and are um, are productive citizens naturally uh, and and it's it's not to say at all that these aren't this isn't part of our role as educators to to support them in realizing the rewards of continuing to be um, you know productive and good to one another and, and that kind of stuff. But I think that there's a lot of fear there for adults that we're opening up a, you know, a, a, a scary situation. And, and the cool thing about, you know, these systems is that they're closed enough that you're going to start to see that stuff fairly quickly. But in our experience, um, we've almost never released one of those things and had, um, and had, you know, the, the worst case happen. So I guess one of my points of advice would be, um, not to be afraid to take a risk and and to spend less time worrying yourself about all the things that that could happen and put that energy into creating a closed sort of beta or a closed prototype where you can have a lots of control you know you don't have to release to everyone uh, at once and where you can have lots of control and an eye on it and uh, you know the the beauty of um, the beauty of a system is you can switch it off, you know. Um, yeah. So, so anyway, maybe a tangent. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I mean it's a wonderful point because it's, you know, in your classroom, you you test it out, you know, with a couple students, you know, and that is a skill. You you know, sure. people get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for finding bugs and letting companies know, you know, yeah. and that's the way, you know, that's the way I think that literacy is moving. I think it's moving to you know, uh, a participatory action. I think it's moving so that everybody can be empowered and we all can read and write and create and revise and remix other people's work. Um, so, Mark, I really appreciate the time. Um, you know, once again, this badge uh, column is in the Journal of Adolescent Adult Literacy. Uh, we focus on um, Zanid. We focus on Mouse and the, the great work that they're doing. Um, Mark, do you have uh, ways that people can get in touch with you and Mouse online? I'll share a lot of it in the blog, but can people get in touch with you on the Internet uh, with more questions and learn more about Mouse? Absolutely. Um, they can learn more about Mouse on uh, mouse, M-O-U-S-C, just out, as it sounds, .org. Um, and the easiest way to get in touch with me is, is usually Twitter, uh, at M-A Lesser, L-E-S-S-E-R. Very cool. Uh, so we encourage other people that are watching this to uh, read the column, watch the videos, think about the complexity of the issues involved, uh, spend a little bit of time getting in touch with uh, the different people that we've interviewed and think about these issues and respond. You know, have video responses, have blog posts, have some sort of reflection or feedback. Uh, Mark, last words? Uh, last words would be uh, to... to have the the courage to move forward uh, and and try it. Uh, there are we're far we're we're very early in this work, and, but we're far enough along that there are some fairly easy ways to to prototype a system for your environment. And uh, we all need to have the courage uh, to push on this a little bit because I think if if all of us sort of throw our hands up and decide. Uh, you know, we're not going to engage until it's further along or until um, some some giant uh, bureaucracy is sort of inviting us to do it. it we will be past the stage where it's going to make the most impact in changing 
um, the sort of structures that we're all sort of working to improve. So I would say uh, to anybody, you know, take take the risk and and let a really phenomenal, I think, community around uh, digital and open badges uh, help support you. Uh, even if it's a very small effort, there are usually folks out there who are very willing to uh, give it give it their thought partnership and time. Thanks a lot, Ian. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. The badging community is very receptive, very helpful, very supportive. Um, so with that being said, we'll wrap up, and thank you for watching.